Good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to our the NDPTC's third Thursday uh, seminar webinar. Um, I know most of you probably who got the flyer uh, was thinking we're going to do a presentation on uh, integrating indigenous knowledge, social economics, and nature-based solutions to build a resilient community. Uh, but that that actually was uh, part of a uh, University of Hawaii's practicum in the Department of Urban Regional Planning. Uh, uh, the, the two students that are presenting today, um, Dingy Liu in Santiago, were in that uh, practicum, but they're not presenting on that subject. Um, we're sorry, but we'll, we'll try to arrange for the other students to present on this integrating indigenous knowledge presentation. Um, so today's presentation is exploring new criteria framework for resilience hubs and greenways, which is part of the line up a practicum, but they're going to be presenting specifically on this uh, resilience hubs and greenways. Um, so I want to start out by saying, um, you know, my name is Eric Yamashita. I'm the Associate Director for the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. <clears throat> um, and I want to acknowledge and thank uh, Karen Awana, going to be leaving NDPTC. Uh, Karen was played a big role in with the practicum class as well as in our response and recovery efforts in Lahaina. She coordinated a lot of the uh, PPE uh, delivery in Lahaina as well as other other uh, meetings with um, some local groups within Lahaina. So I wanna thank Karen for all her work with us. <clears throat> okay. Hey, Ethan and uh, Dingy, you wanna get started? Uh, sure thing. Hello everybody, thank you for taking the time out of your day, wherever you may be, for uh, joining us in this presentation and exploring new criteria framework for resilient hubs and greenways. I'm Ethan, uh, to my left is Ding Yi. We're both graduate students in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and this project is supported by NDPTC, of course. Ding Yi, off to you. Thanks, Eric, by the way. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ding Yi, and I'm excited to be here today. And so this is what I had to do today. So at first, I'll go over resilience hub. I'll talk about resilience hub in Maui, in Wolf, and uh, other places in the, all across the country. And then I'll close with uh, some funding sources. And uh, Ethan then will uh, present a theoretical Lahaina bypass greenway. And then he'll also uh, move to Big Island in Hawaii to uh, talk about the streamside trail of Waimea in Big Island, Hawaii. And then we will travel to uh, the mainland also uh, to New Orleans to explore the Lafayette Greenway. And then uh, here also close with uh, some funding sources. And then we will talk a little bit about the motor cultural analysis in resilience hub and uh, greenway. So at the first, I want to uh, introduce uh, Resilience Hub, if you are not very familiar with this term. Resilience Hub is a facility that leads and uh, operated by communities. It provides resources and services to foster unity and uh, resilience. They offer essential amenities such as public space, child care, and uh, educational programs. And uh, those facilities transform into critical support centers during disasters. So it provides telecommunication, medical supplies, emergency power, food, and clean water. These hubs are also designed to withstand and quickly recover from disasters, including storms, heat waves, floods, power outages, or pandemics, with support from local authorities and uh, partner organizations. So as mentioned, uh, the Resilience Hub operates differently in blue sky 
which is uh, non-emergency scenarios, and in gray sky, which is uh, emergency scenarios. In blue sky operations, um, so there are three different uh, standards for uh, resilience hub. So for the basic, it should provide a connectivity uh, for neighborhoods and also public restroom and uh, water fountain, water bottle refill stations. For the enhanced network resilience hub, it should provide uh, the first, I, first aid and CPR and other educational training for public and also portable water, food generation on site or, or around the site. For an advanced resilience hub, uh, it should provide affordable housing and a temporary housing child care. And also microgrid with backup power generation. In a grid scale operation scenario, it also has three uh, standards. For the basic standard, before the event, it should provide affordable water, ready to eat meals, and space, and a spare clothing and uh, tolerators. And after the event, the hub should add, should add communities with charging stations for plug node devices and uh, high frequency radio. And for an enhanced hub, it should provide childcare and support, commercial teaching, and uh, adequate capacity for shouting before the event. And after the event, it can help with uh, debris removal and uh, design the location to bring all types of debris. For an advanced network uh, resilience hub, it should uh, um, provide access food dehydrated and uh, stored. And uh, wastewater treatment and a storm water management system before the event. And after the event, it should use for or form debris and, and also it should uh, provide a mental and a physical recovery support for communities. So the resilience hub is a lot, it's not a new concept, at least for me. Um, I'm from Sichuan in China and 16 years ago, May 12, 2008, there was a, a eight magnitude earthquake happened in my hometown and it killed 80,000 people. And I was very young. I was still in the elementary school when, I, when the earthquake happened. But I remember very clearly after the earthquake, there was a resilience hub in Jojo Stadium, Yinyang City, which is uh, only about 30 miles away from the center of the earthquake. And this stadium provided a, a shelter for more than 40,000 people. And it provided uh, meals, provided uh, water uh, for those people who lost their homes. And from the right bottom, you can see there's a man who was, seek, was seeking his families in the stadium. So um, apparently uh, this, it's not a, a planned resilience hub. It's just a very emergency um, hub that uh, organized by government. But uh, what I'm going to talk today is uh, the hub that leads and organized by communities, and it is not, and it was supported by uh, government. Okay, so at first I want to uh, have a word count question. What should a resilience hub address before we get into the uh, those resilience hub criteria? I'll start sharing my screen, everybody. Uh, Dean is going to share his screen, and there is a um, place for you guys can scan a QR code that's going to be on his screen, and you guys can participate and an activity that me and him are gonna do. Well, he's gonna do the activity first, I'll do one later on. Yeah, so this is a core code and you can also use code 
Okay, we got first aid, food, water, mental health. That's great. Thank you. It looks like a lot of people seem shelter, food, mental health. That's food and water, communication. Great. Oh, yeah. We also got some from the chat, social safety. Hello, you can hear me? Right on. Okay. Anticipative or perfect. Yeah. yeah, thanks everyone for the response. Diversing fun activities. That's great, that's great. Yeah. We're giving a lot of money to me for everyone to be responsible. So, I think it's very important to give you a chance 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 to give you yeah, it's only, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, thanks everyone. So from this water cloud, we can see people have a lot of different ideas. Mm -hmm. And so if we bring them into a resilience hub criteria plan, so it will make us, you know, think a lot of things to integrate a lot of things and we need to hear from a lot of people and to gather the information. Would well, anyone like to speak to me for about a minute and a half to share their responses and why they uh, put what they put, maybe? Okay. 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 We can just move on. Uh, what about uh, what uh, what the resilience hub in Maui? So uh, Maui County published the climate action and the resilience plan in 2022. So in the, this plan, uh, there are 22 resilience strategies were prioritized and the 84 supporting actions to prepare for and the strengthen resilience to potential climate certain. So from this plan, 
it mentioned uh, resilience hub in at least uh, three places. And it suggested a resilience hub should include emergency satellite phones, ham radios, and a portable connectivity. And also, resilience hub should have a network which connecting emergency shelters, community-based emergency management organizations. And also, uh, resilience hub should uh, incorporate uh, nature-based solutions and uh, land use regulation. So what Maui encountered with uh, uh, natural hazards, uh, there's a uh, flooding happened in Maui, there's a storm, and there also king tide also um, getting to the highway sometimes. And also, sorry, the fire. So from 1990, there's a big fire happened in West Maui. And 2018, there's another big wildfire in Nahaina. And uh, last year, the big wildfire destroyed over 2,000 structures and 100 people died from the, uh, this strategy. And there's a very long way to recover uh, from, uh, from this wildfire. But in the very short term, there's at least a 13 community resilience hub uh, was set up in very short time in Nahaina, I mean, I mean in, in Maui. And those community hubs provide all kind of emergency shelters, food and water to those who are uh, impacted by the wildfire. Uh, Napini Noho is uh, one of them. It's a community-based emergency distribution hub and they distribute donated food, produce, dry goods, hygiene items, and more until today. And Nahaina Safety Center uh, was one of the first planned resilience hub in Maui. And it is set to open at, as a resilience hub in June 6, 2024, which is in a month. And in a blue sky scenario, uh, the Civic Center has weekly community meetings uh, on every Wednesday. And also, it is also a place for uh, a lot of basketball tournaments and uh, what kind of sports or expo or other community activities. And after the June, uh, since the June six, the open space behind the Civic Center will serve as a good storage for resilience hub. So there's a lot of uh, goods, including food and uh, uh, medical supplies, kitchen supplies will stored in this big open space behind the, the Civic Center. So there are two uh, resilience hub was planned in Nahaila and one is Nahaila Safety Center and the other is uh, Signal Services, which is in the kind of the middle of the, uh, uh, the, the town. So if we overlapping some criteria, uh, some of them mentioned in, um, in, the, in the plan, and some of are not, but it's very valued in, you know, in here in Hawaii. And so it's kind of like a, like overlap map of how those map, how those hubs connect with those surroundings, in, including the natural resources, the business and the cultural sites. And another, another uh, resilience hub example uh, in Wall, in 2019, the city and the county of Honolulu uh, 
published the OLAR resilience strategies plan. So in the plan, there's a, a goal to develop a network of community resilience hubs. Uh, so in this plan, uh, the resilience hub was defined as an emergency shelter during a disaster and uh, also a community gathering space and uh, also a place to provide a renew renewable energy and water and food and medical supplies. So Wolf and the whole Hawaii also faces uh, a lot of flooding issues, including today is a very rainy day here in Hawaii. And hurricanes. So the, uh, also is very frequent in Hawaii and every year we have to prepare for the hurricane season. And in 1992, the most powerful hurricane Hawaii in uh, destroyed a lot of facilities. Uh, I mean, the, a lot of uh, properties and uh, caused seven fatalities in Hawaii. So in response to the resilience hub plan in the resilience strategies plan, uh, Center for Resilience Neighbors has a, uh, from the University of Hawaii has a action 15 team. Uh, I'm, I'm very privileged to, to be one of the team. And so we had uh, two phases of community engagement of resilience hub. And the, in the phase one, uh, we did a distribution of island-wide survey. And in the phase two, we did uh, a lot of community engagement. We went to a lot of um, native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities. And uh, we had a lot of regional neighborhood focus groups and uh, workshops. And uh, uh, in the end, we have a final report uh, delivery based on our uh, the two phases. So in WALF, we have set uh, six criteria for resilience hub site selections, which include uh, proximity to critical infrastructure, social vulnerability, hazard exposure, transportation accessibility, community support, and uh, hazard sites. Uh, and we also um, have the, those data connection and the cleaning, and then we create a composite scores for each criteria, and then we have a final overall suitability map of based on those six criteria and uh, their sub criteria. And this is uh, the final maps uh, we got the overall suitability maps of Resilience Hub. However, uh, Resilience Hub is not a universal definition. So this is an example of beautiful community resilience hub, Kohonoa Community Resilience Hub, which is in the uh, windward side of Owa. So this is a five acre proposing facility that would be able to withstand a category five hurricane and provide critical resources, including shelter, food, water, medical services, and the internet for up to 30 days during a disaster. The non-profit organization Hui or Hawula developed the, the plans for this hub. And uh, they also collaborate with uh, local planning and the uh, architect sectors uh, on this project. And also in Big Island, there is also uh, a group of people working on uh, Resilience Hub uh, since 2020, there has there at least 13, 30 hubs have been identified across all the islands, and they provided the support on student learning, digital connectivity, food assistance, resilience, and the wellness program and the wellness programming. And in the mainland, uh, in there's a lot of cities also uh, 
working on a resilience hub project. So uh, these are two examples from Baltimore and uh, Seattle. They also have a lot of community engagement meetings on this, and they also set their own criteria rules for resilience hub site selection. And I also want to talk about some funding opportunities. There are both uh, funding opportunities from federal so and the uh, state. So from federal, there's a lot of uh, funding from FEMA. So there's two examples on the right side, which is uh, BRIC and uh, uh, HMGP, uh, and also EPA, NOAA, US Forest Service, Community Development Block Grant. They also have a lot of funding. And also the state um, also has a lot of grants. They can support the, uh, the, those community resilience work. So uh, I want to uh, end with uh, some resilience hub, when, when we determine some resilience hub criteria. So there's uh, uh, something uh, I, I feel like very challenging. So the first is uh, we want to address the local disasters. So like in, uh, if we are trying to do the resilience hub in my hometown or in Japan, in Taiwan, they might, we, we might consider earthquake. If we are doing, if we are uh, doing resilience hub in Big Island, Hawaii, we might consider volcano. And if we want, if we are doing the resilience hub in Hawaii or in Japan or in, you know, around the Pacific Ocean, we might want to consider tsunami. So different places uh, we have, we, we have to address our their own local uh, disaster. And uh, I also feel uh, social vulnerability, social economic is very, also very important. And when we trying to plan those resilience how we should very pay attention to the age group of the communities and the food preference and what medicals we should uh, uh, provide more and uh, how much electricity, how much EV in the uh, in the communities, right? How uh, and uh, you know how and we have to have an estimate how like how much electricity the community will be used, and also preventing the secondary disasters like uh, pandemic. Um, I mean the you know the spread of virus is very likely after the disaster. And uh, also, like after the earthquake, the landslide is also very likely. So, preventing the secondary disasters is also very important in the resilience hub. And I think for the resilience hub, the most important thing is the uh, public engagement. So, we need to uh, have more research on care, how we can care as much as the, the most people. and we and we can like how how do we integrate everyone's suggestions, everyone's ideas into resilience of science and actions. That's uh, really important. Okay, so next let's let's uh, hand over to Ethan to talk about Greenway. Hey guys, so again, uh, my name is Ethan, and uh, thank you very much, Dingy, for your presentation on resilience hubs. But going into greenways, uh, what are the benefits that we can explore, or what do uh, greenways uh, have benefits for people, um, the environment, infrastructure, so on and so forth? So we can see that greenways support multimodal transportation um, beyond the use of a car. Uh, they also have the potential to mitigate impacts from natural hazards, uh, serve as recreational. Um, places where people can go to and can also support biodiversity flourishment. And I go into these benefits um, after uh, this slide, of course. So a project that me and Dingy have been doing um, kind of looks at 
Lahaina and the bypass road that runs on the eastern side of Lahaina. Uh, we're thinking about theoretically, well, what if the bypass road had an extension in the form of a greenway? So we wanted to make sure that if we were to do a theoretical greenway, it has to support already existing plans. So we looked at our existing state plans of the um, master bike plan that Hawaii has, as well as another greenway project called the West Maui Greenway Project um, that's already ongoing, um, both of which serve for recreational purposes. Um, enhancing accessibility to multimodal ways of transportation. So this goes for bicyclists and pedestrians. And then in doing so, it's an effort to reduce uh, vehicular carbon emissions, kind of go along with our state plans to reduce carbon emissions by the year 2050. Um, as for our biological benefit, in Hawaii, there's a lot of, uh, we're known as endemic uh, extinction capital of the world. Um, a lot of our endemic species are subject to um, extinction based off of, of course, human intervention, human interaction. The nene goose, um, which is an endemic bird species, was on the brink of extinction, but now they're not really in the brink of extinction, but they're um, more or less being reincorporated into the wild. Uh, we see that the integration of a greenway can help allow the nene goose um, to safely traverse um, distances without being threatened by, of course, cars and then being run over from the cars. Considering the wildfire that happened in Lahaina last year, we also see that the Greenway can pose as a buffer and a fire break potential. Um, the spread of the fire um, in 2018 and last year spread from an east to west direction. Um, by having a bypass go be an extension of the, uh, sorry, the Greenway be an extension of the bypass it can be seen that from an east to west perspective that the greenway can slow down or possibly even prevent uh, the fire from being spread to other um, houses or any infrastructure that could be in the way of the spread of the fire. We also get into the benefit of uh, having shade trees being planted around the greenway itself and that attracts pedestrians, bicycle users, of course, but it also addresses places that may be subject to uh, urban heat island. So urban heat island is a phenomenon that's addressed or that is associated with uh, climate change. So basically what that means is where there is urban development when the heat from the sun um, is on that paved ground, it doesn't really get properly distributed and absorbed into the ground. Rather, it's more or less reflected into um, the atmosphere where it could be uncomfortable for people to walk. It could be uncomfortable for people to just even ride bikes. So with the integration of shade trees um, to the greenway, we can see that it can reduce urban heat island that could be felt on the greenway, making it more attractive to pedestrians and bicycle users. And we see that in Hawaii, um, the lahala tree and the ulu tree are both endemic species, but can also be used as um, uh, shade trees as well, too. So we want to reincorporate the fact that um, endemic species was there, and we want to make sure that endemic species will continue to be there moving on into the future. Um, of course, there is funding uh, from the University of Hawaii when it comes to the planting and the maintenance of these trees on the very bottom as well, too. So the very top picture is the ulu tree and the very bottom picture is the lahala tree. Now, staring away from uh, Lahaina, you see that on the big island, there is also a, a greenway that can um, be used by pedestrians or bicyclists. Uh, it's located in South Kahala, Waimea, uh, on the island of Hawaii or the big island, which is up north. Waimea is up north. Um, economic drivers of this area is agriculture and tourism, of course. But within this area, there is a Hawaii Belt Road, which is a four-lane highway. Um, this highway, I've driven on it personally. My uncle lives in Waimea. 
it's a it's pretty narrow. There's no bike infrastructure. There's no uh, pedestrian infrastructure. There's no bike lanes or there's no um, sidewalks for people to just um, use bikes or even just walk. It's really unsafe for both of those um, ways of transportation. So this greenway, uh, the construction of this greenway, it runs alongside parallel with the, um, the highway. And during its construction, we saw the removal of invasive plant species um, to let the endemic species, whatever is left over, flourish. It connects activity generators. So we can see shopping centers, parks, and schools. And it's a safe area for multimodal users, um, bikers or pedestrians to traverse through. Now going along into the mainland, we see um, New Orleans, they have a Lafitte Greenway. So a little bit of background when it comes to this is that this is, comes into consideration um, after the event of Hurricane Katrina. This is a gray skies um, scenario where an event happened and okay, this is a plan that we need to take to make sure that if an event happens like this again, we can mitigate the consequences that could happen. Um, considering that and the history that New Orleans is a city that is located on a delta, um, Concerning um, changes with climate change uh, affects increased flood risk. NOLA lawmakers or New Orleans lawmakers and planners are seeking blue and green infrastructure alternatives to enhance climate resilience. Um, this, of course, is in the form of the Greenway. And there's two main criteria that they wanted to address with the Greenway is to enhance citizen quality of life uh, during times when there's no storm events. So it's for recreational purposes, but to also act as an environmental buffer, protecting built environment during storm events. And this could be in the form of flooding, of course. So when the Greenway was established in 2015, it addressed the recreational benefits through the addition of green space that people can, can use. NOLA or uh, New Orleans already has an extensive um, bike network. Um, it's about 87 miles. And the addition of the Greenway serves as a backbone for people uh, wanting to expand their uh, use of the bike throughout New Orleans. It connects the French Quarter of New Orleans to uh, Lake Pont Chartrain. Pont Chartrain, sorry, I butchered the word. But more or less, it enhances multimodal capacities throughout the town. Um, and during times of uh, storm, storm events and flooding, it can serve as an active transportation route. Um, so when roadways may be flooded, essential services and essential resources could still be uh, transported using the Greenway. Um, the Greenway also addresses flooding concerns through the addition of bioswales throughout the Greenway itself too. So the Greenway is about three miles and three miles long, uh, connecting, like I said, the French Quarter and um, the Lake Pontchartrain. train. And biosoils, what they are is that there are um, more or less ditches in the ground to manage the direction of storm water runoff. And when we come into the funding for the Lahaina Green, or sorry, Greenways in general, um, more or less um, this goes over our research, what me and Dingy have done for a theoretical Greenway. We can see that. Um, when it comes to Lahaina Greenway, there are the DOT raise grants um, from FEMA. There's pre-disaster mitigation grants and uh, the Safeguarding Tomorrow Revolving Loan Funding Program for FEMA. Actually, now considering this, these are all FEMA grants and these are all um, nationally accessible, not uh, specific to Lahaina itself. Um, when it comes to the maintenance of these greenways, the Department of Transportation has a recreational trails program. Uh, the American Hiking Society. So not all greenways can be paved. They can be trails themselves too. Um, the American Hiking Society has a national trails fund that when it comes to improvement of access and safety of the trails. And um, under national law, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, HR 3684, um, there's a lot of money that goes towards the infrastructure repairs and the maintenance 
of projects such as greenery or projects that allow for multimodal transportation in addition to roadways themselves. So like Dingy had earlier, um, I also have a Mentimeter or this um, way for you guys to interact with a question that I posted. So give me a second there. Please raise your hand. And so this one, everybody, is what should Greenways address? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm We have about two more minutes for people to share their responses, but I like what it sees so far. I do agree with the points that you guys mentioned too when it comes to mental health, the access or the public access or enhancing public access to green space away from urban developed environments in a way just decompresses the mind itself too, alleviates blood pressure and there's scientific journal articles about that too. A lot more research could be done about that. But I do agree with those points. Oh, light pollution is good too. Yeah. Light pollution is really good too. I like that. Garbage. Urban forest. Yes. Yeah. Endemic species. Right on, everybody. Well, thank you guys for your responses and a little more. Defensible space, buffer zone, yes. Love that. Sorry. All right, on everybody, thank you guys for sharing your responses. Does anyone want to go over any of the things that they shared? Uh, why did they pick what they shared? I love all the suggestions for sure. Crime. At the end of the chat, too.
I think we're okay. Who wants it? Yeah. I don't want to share from my screen. Why don't we open up the webinar discussion? Uh, I think we just have like one more. Yeah, Zingy has one more slide. More slides, and then we'll get into the okay. yeah questions. Yeah, we're on we're on time. Yeah, we're on time. time. Okay, so we just discussed about mm -hmm. different criteria, right? But how do we integrate those different criteria? Right, so I uh, so we have to use the multi criteria the multi criteria decision analysis MCDA. So that is use multiple criteria and put it them in two together in order to rank to choose between the alternative. And uh, analytic hierarchy process HP is uh, one of the most popular MCDA methods, which compare. Uh, which do a pairwise pair comparison to determine the relative width of various criteria. So the map you know, is an example uh, when we did the, the walk resilience of suitability analysis. So we have four layers, uh, the proximity to ponies and the fire, farmers market, hospital and clinic, and emergency shelter. And we put it uh, into together in the uh, MCDA, and uh, we have the map in, in, on the right. Uh, so we, we we value this MCDA process a lot. And here today we want to uh, test, uh, not like test, but we want to uh, spare out a survey uh, on and the uh, uh, resilience top and the uh, greenway criteria. So uh, I shared a, a link on the chat. So if you can open, there's a Google form and it has uh, four resilience top criteria and five greenway criteria. And if you can help us to kind of rank what is the uh, most important criteria, what is second most criteria, what is third most important criteria. And if you have any, if you feel we are missing any criteria, uh, you're also welcome to uh, drop any, you know, you, the criteria you feel very important than the survey. People have trouble opening that form. I don't know. I mean, I, I think I had some trouble opening that form. Uh, we wait for Dingy and Ethan to look at that form, the access to the form. Um, does anybody have any questions, any comments? We see Liz Fisher has put a lot of information on the chat. Oh, these are some of our work cited. And then, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we can open up to questions. And um, thank you again, everybody, for taking the time out of your day. To come here our project this is an ongoing project too so we would love feedback from you guys to just build on what we already have maybe some change some things around or just uh, to hear from you guys what we could add what we could change to make this project and our research more holistic thank you everybody
Oh, uh, CL2, are you raising your hand? Uh, no, sorry, Professor? sorry, Ethan. Um, <laughs> can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Hi, sorry, no, so, sorry, Ethan. I just was, um, I did a clap, several reactors. React to your presentation, um, both of you, um, your presentation. Thank you so much. That was all. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. So, um, Ethan, um, so Liz Fisher, who's, you know, posted a lot of information right on the, she, she asked that you reach out to her as right her on. email. It's in the chat, her email. Oh, dear. Thank you very much. I, I think, um, sure. Also, um, Dr. Miku, yeah, yeah, provided a lot of um, additional resources and contact information. I think Dingy's worked with Miku in the past, right? Yes, yes, he has. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I can't have my camera on. I'm actually out running a climate and community resilience training in Hilo right now. <laughs> so, but I wanted to listen and support. So yeah, very happy um, for this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, thank you, Miku. Thank you. Ms. Fisher, could you please send your um, contact information one more time, maybe? Love to keep in contact with you. Must have lost it in the chat. On tech, are you looking for? Yeah, I'm gonna put this in the chat below. I'm gonna put in the chat below, uh, my own school email. So for anyone who wants to come talk to me about um, greenways or resilience of the course, I can of course forward that email to Dingy. Of course, I'm gonna put my email in the chat too. Actually, maybe you can put yours yeah. too. Yeah, I remember you picked uh, me. I said that too. There we go. There we go. Everyone can see it now. Does anyone have more questions, comments? Um, yeah, the purpose of this presentation is we want to hear from you and and this uh resilience of and a green way criteria and science and action. Yeah, so so that questionnaire that Dingy's been putting out, so we what we're trying to do is uh have people rate the criteria or rank the criteria and then eventually use the AHP or some multi-criteria analysis to uh, actually determine what are the what are people seeing, what are seen are the best or the most important criteria to selection of a, a resilience hub or a greenway. Hi everyone. Um, sorry, I couldn't be there with you in office today. Um, I have a quick question. Um, in terms of the indigenous knowledge and the incorporation of that into your thinking, um, and 
also the whole um, Community Resilience Hub. Um, I'm from New Zealand and we, um, I guess, work a lot with our community and a lot of what our community say to us is, you know, don't come in here and try and tell us what to do, but come and listen and let us lead. And I guess that's what I'm hearing from your whole collective class project that um, this whole kind of project has been about going in and listening and then from there um, creating this. So well done for that. And the Indigenous Knowledge Incorporation, is that like the, um, the, the, the information that you're talking about in terms of using the 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 like the oral tree and things like that is that what you're talking about or is it in terms of listening to the elders of native hawaiian culture and incorporating that into your project that's a very good question thank you very much for pointing out yeah so um so uh we actually we want to try to incorporate those cultural stuff into our resilience hub connection is like based on how the Hawaiian, how the Asian the Hawaiian people uh, value the resilience and how they did the resilience, how they practice resilience. And I wanted, we wanted to, you know, do the similar way how they practice the resilience in our resilience hub. Yeah. So when it comes to that class project that, that we did with the international um, a lot of the research that we came across were actually from the old newspaper articles. So of course this 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 uh, presentation is building off of that project, of course, but it goes deeper into um, how other people from around the nation could look at resilience hubs or greenways from the things that we researched on. So maybe during the implementation of resilience of the Greenway projects across the nation, of course, they're not gonna have a native Hawaiian cultural uh, knowledge background. Um, but from what our research that we have both done, the way that we came across um, cultural context was through um, old newspaper articles in the 1800s and new PEPA articles, um, interactions with um, state and the county office of the mayor in Maui and just talking to um, people that are from Lahaina as well too, beyond um, the frame of uh, politicians and any other um, organizational ties, of course. Um, when it comes to acquiring cultural context beyond Hawaii, of course, there, there would, of course, have to be more baseline analysis when it comes to respecting um, the implementation of rightfully, uh, respectfully, um, implementation, I'm losing my train of thought here when it comes to outside of Hawaii. But um, local context does need to be uh, taken into consideration and it does need to be enforced in a right way too, to have its own respects. So yeah. yeah, and that could be in the form of finding uh, through, like I said, old newspaper articles or even just um, talking to um, the elders, of course, and communities and so on and so forth. So, yeah, kind of going on the lines of what we did for our project, but it could, there could be some relation going into projects abroad, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, last minute questions?